Okay, so what we're going to do in Unit 8 is take the stuff that we learned in Unit 7, which was, I think, largely review, um, aside from the maybe the quadratic resonance stuff, and we're going to see how we can put it to use in terms of system design. Um, we're not going to be learning anything new about systems, right? We're still going to classify systems. Are they stable or unstable? How much steady state error do they exhibit? Um, and how fast are their transient responses? Uh, that's still going to be our bread and butter, but we are going to approach it from the frequency domain rather than from the time domain and rather than from the S domain. Um, I'm not quite sure why I teach this class in the order that I do. Um, probably in large part it's because of the order that the lab manual is written. And in the lab manual, the final experiment is a frequency response type experiment. So it kind of comes at the end of the lecture as well. Um, but there's no reason that you would have to learn this after root locus. Uh, the, the two are, as far as I can tell, interchangeable. So if you notice a lot of stuff that you say, oh, well, we could do that in root locus. Yeah, that's great. I'm <laughs> that's good that you're making those observations. Um, and I think it's also good that you learn multiple tools to analyze systems, especially because the frequency domain is, I would venture, a more practical tool when analyzing real world, hold in your hand type systems. Um, those of you who have, I don't know, bought, say, audio equipment, um, headphones, speakers, and whatnot, um, the higher end equipment will come with a frequency response printed on the manual or on the box. And you are hard pressed to find a speaker set that will have a root locus or a transfer function printed on the manual or the box. So it's just that you, we have equipment that can quickly and easily determine the frequency response of systems. Um, and often that's actually how it will go is you will run the frequency response experiment. You'll try to identify what the system is. And then from the frequency response data, you'll back out what the transfer function should be or could be. And then if you like, you can run root locus uh, with that. So in a little, in some sense, we are doing this kind of backwards. Um, but for the time being, let's consider the question of do I want to look at the open loop Bode plot or do I want to look at the closed loop Bode plot? Now we have talked at nauseum in this class about how those two things are different, the open loop transfer function and the closed loop transfer function. They each have their role, but they are distinctly different objects. And so it should make sense to you that the open loop transfer function Bode plot and the closed loop transfer function Bode plot are also going to be different and will have different uses. Okay, so just to make that concrete, let's take a very simple example. So this is a unity feedback system with a first order pole and a variable open loop gain. So if we were to draw the magnitude plot, I'm gonna, I'm gonna toss the phases out for now just because uh, I wanna just talk about the magnitudes. This open loop system will have, well, let's put, Let's put P here in the center. So this would be 10P and this would be P over 10. And the pole will kind of sit here at zero and then it'll go tug us down at 20 degrees per decade. So this is just the, the role of the pole. The constant is going to be, well, either uh, bigger than one or less than one. I'm gonna draw it as, it as if it were bigger than one. So let's put the constant somewhere up here. And this is the quantity 20 log of K. All right, so putting these together, this is I'm sure something you've seen before, is we take something that was uh, zero dBs and adding it to something that's non-zero, so that'll shift this curve up until we get to P radians per second. 
in which case we will then drop at a minus 20 dB per decade slope. So this is the open loop uh, transfer function magnitude response in decibels. Okay. So as you'd expect, this is a low pass filter uh, that passes frequencies below P and starts to attenuate frequencies above P. Uh, if you would like, you could also include the 3 dB per dec sorry, the 3 dB corner correction. Uh, but for the purposes of this uh, example, I'm going to leave it just as a straight line approximation. So uh, that is what it is. But now I want to transition to talking about what the closed loop transfer function would look like. So let's get our week one hats back on. And if I were to do this, this would be summing junction with the G in the forward path unity feedback. Uh, so the closed loop transfer function is going to be G over 1 plus G. Um, so that looks like K over S on P plus 1 plus K. All right. So this is no longer in leading one's form. So it might pay dividends to factor out the 1 plus K. So this is going to be k over 1 plus k times the quantity s over p times 1 plus k plus 1. So if I distribute that back in, I think I recover what I had. And now we're back to leading ones. So the constant here is kind of hiding from us. It's k on 1 plus k. So k over 1 plus k. Well, that's a, that's a number that's kind of close to 1, isn't it? Especially if k is large, like I kind of drew here. So for if k is large, in this case, I drew it as 20 dBs, which is a factor of 10. So 10 over 10 plus 1, that's nearly 11. Or sorry, <laughs> 10 over 11 is nearly 1. And so my point is that um, the constant term is actually close to 0 dBs now. The pole is no longer at P radians per second. The pole is now at, well, it's nearly K times P radians per second. So again, if we use the approximation uh, to help us draw that K is about 10, then all of a sudden we're looking not at uh, P radians per second, but closer to 10 P. In this case, it would be 11 P. So. This would then be, say, right about there, and dropping at this slope. So you basically have to kind of pick a, a K to kind of work with, but then you're going to still put it in um, kind of um, algebraically? But you're putting 10 at P, so that it means you are choosing what it so, yeah, let's, is. Let's, let's do the first version, uh, assuming K is 10. And then we can see what happens if we change K. How about that? OK. So overall, we would get something that looks like this. So this is the closed loop transfer function magnitude with k of about 10. So, right, and, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll vary k in a bit, but I just want to point out that in the open loop, we had this massive DC uh, gain, and in closed loop, that has all but disappeared. Um, the other thing is that the frequency, the corner frequency of this filter, and it's still a low-pass filter, that's interesting to note. Uh, the corner frequency has moved on us. 
And the way that you, the way that I like to think about that is, well, yeah, if you uh, wrap a system in a feedback loop, you are going to change what used to be the open loop poles into closed loop poles. And those closed loop poles will be at different frequencies than the open loop poles were, at different locations in the S-plane, if you want to think about this from a root locus perspective. Um, maybe that might be helpful if we look at this from a root locus perspective. Um, the open loop pole is at negative P which means that the root locus for variable K is just due west from that pole, which means that any positive K that we would pick means that the closed loop pole ends up having a larger distance from the origin or a larger corner frequency uh, than the open loop pole. So in some sense, uh, as K gets smaller, the corner is going to move to the left, but with a hard stop at P. And as K gets smaller, what happens to the gain here, or the constant? So small over one plus small is small. And so the corner frequency moves left, and the DC gain moves down. Okay. On the other hand, if we were to let K increase, there isn't much room for the magnitude or the DC gain to change because the limit as K goes to infinity of K over one plus K is exactly one, which is zero dBs. So as K increases, this low frequency asymptote is just gonna get closer and closer to zero dBs. There is no limit on the corner frequency as K increases. So as K increases, we get this uh, low frequency gain closer and closer to zero dBs from the bottom, right? It's always approaching. Um, this fraction is always less than or equal to one. And it becomes one as K gets infinite. Uh, and the corner frequency will move higher and higher and higher. So one way to think about this is increasing K to the limit will push this closed loop pole way the heck out here, which means that its corresponding frequency is very, very large. Okay. The only change in the open loop plot, if we were to change K, would be to move this line up or down, which then would mean the blue plot would move up and down but there would be no change in the pole location. Sorry, in the pole frequency. Questions on connecting. I think that, I think this, I think this root locus diagram is helpful because it's a way to bridge uh, what you would have predicted using your root locus techniques to what you will also predict using your Bode techniques. Um, and just the fact that the larger, the further a point is from the origin, uh, the larger this frequency is going to be. So basically, the further to the to the um, right, the frequency plot to uh, corner frequency is the <clears throat> the further to the left, the the root locus plot will be to the left. It, yeah, it is unfortunate that it's uh, one goes to the right and one goes to the left. That's why I'm mostly talking in terms of like distance instead. <laughs> instead of cardinal directions. Um, but yeah, things that are further from the origin to the left in the S-plane uh, have corners that are further to the right on the Bode plane. Yeah. So if you were gonna talk about how fast this system was, this closed loop system, would you want to make K large or small to make this system fast? Large? For sure. So the old maxim still holds that uh, poles that are further from the origin are faster. There is only one pole in this closed loop system, and we've seen that as we increase k, we move it very, very far away. 
you can also see that from the closed loop Bode plot. And that is that uh, this corner moves higher and higher as K increases. And that should connote something to you. This should feel like a bandwidth type uh, question. That as I move the corner frequency higher and higher, there are more frequencies, there is more space on this axis that is um, not attenuated. Okay. And so that is the topic of the next slide. The system bandwidth um, for our electromechanical control systems is the frequency where the magnitude response drops 3 dBs below its low frequency asymptote. Um, now, you can get 10 engineers in a room and ask them to define system bandwidth and you'll get 10 different answers. Uh, this is the one that I'd like to use for this class because it has a lot of nice consequences. Um, the drawbacks are, before I get to the nice things, the drawbacks are that it really only makes sense. This definition only makes sense if there is a low frequency value. In particular, if your magnitude response is band passy, there is no low frequency value. If your frequency response is high passy, then the low frequency value would be zero. Uh, so this, this ceases to make sense in these cases. However, most of the time when we're talking about electromechanical systems, they do end up being uh, low pass like. So this, this definition works for the kinds of systems that we are talking about in this class. If you had uh, if you were some kind of analog filter designer um, and you needed to talk about band pass systems all the time, you would have a different definition of bandwidth. Okay. Um, so, for example, if we have the system that we had on the previous page, so G O in Unity Feedback, we saw that this system has a low frequency gain of k over 1 plus k and a corner frequency at p times 1 plus k. And so what you'd want to do is you want to figure out what is this number in decibels? And then you would want to go three below that. So one, two, three. So this would be what I'd call omega sub B, or the bandwidth of this uh, closed loop system. Okay. Wouldn't the bandwidth be um, like right underneath the one plus K, like just three dB below? Excellent point, because of the three dB correction for each pole. So let me correct this, because what I have here is the straight line approximation. It's an excellent point. What we're actually gonna be seeing is this 3db corrected, which occurs right there at the pole frequency. Fantastic. So that means that this would be the bandwidth itself. Okay. So this is nice. This means it jives with your notion of uh, pass bands and all that stuff from 212, that the pole frequency itself represents the bandwidth. Okay. And so here we can see that increasing k so if K increases, bandwidth increases. Uh, if P increases, bandwidth increases. And both of these have the effect of speeding up the system in, in terms of transient response. Um, the other nice thing about this definition, and it's really, really when you're talking about a system's bandwidth, can, and I wanna, I wanna clarify because if you're taking 314 or if you remember from 228 we talked a lot about signal bandwidth and I want to differentiate those two the signal bandwidth can have its own definition but a system bandwidth is what I'm talking about here and I like this definition of system bandwidth because it plays nicely into my sense of what bandwidth should represent for a system and that is the bandwidth of a system should represent 
the range of frequencies over which you don't care about frequencies. Let me explain that. If I have uh, in this system some oscillating input here, if that frequency lies within the bandwidth of this system, then I'm going to get some attenuation, some phase shift out. But whether I do it at this frequency or a slightly lower frequency, they're both going to get treated the same, right? So if this was omega one and omega two, if omega one is here and omega two is here, then according to this red curve, they're both going to get treated the same. So I don't care that omega one and omega two are different because the system will do the same thing to them, to each of them. Now, if I come in here and I bring in a oscillation with frequency omega three, and that's way up here. Now, all of a sudden I have to worry about what omega three is because if omega three is here versus omega four that's out here, now these two things are gonna get treated differently. They're gonna be attenuated differently, okay? So my favorite interpretation of system bandwidth is the range of frequencies over which you don't have to care about frequencies. The converse of that statement is if you are operating outside of your system's bandwidth, you must worry about what frequency you're operating at because the frequency will dictate how the signals are attenuated and phase shifted. Whereas if you're operating within the bandwidth, the frequency does not really matter. Everything will be attenuated largely the same. Everything will be phase shifted largely the same. And so you don't have to care about different frequencies. Okay, I think that's where I would like to quit for today. Uh, we have a couple more minutes, so I will take questions if you have them. In the chat, does bandwidth Does bandwidth correspond to the range of frequencies that we don't want in the root locus? Um, I don't think that that's, I've never thought about it that way. Um, no, I, I don't think that's a helpful way to think about it. So again, the question was, uh, does bandwidth relate to the range of frequencies that we don't want in the root locus? Um, think of it more like, the bandwidth of the system is going to, and we're going to get to more detail on this in the next lecture or the one after, the bandwidth of the system is kind of like talking about the dominant pole of the system. So if you have uh, two poles, two closed loop poles, uh, no matter how you get them there, if you have two closed loop poles in the S plane, this one is going to be at low frequency. This one is going to be at higher frequency. which means that your magnitude plot is gonna kink once at the higher, at the lower frequencies and then kink again at the higher frequency pole. So this is low and this is higher. But the bandwidth of this system would be here. So this slower pole tends to dominate and it will tend to dictate the bandwidth. So. That is uh, getting to this bullet point that the system speed is often expressed in terms of the bandwidth, that faster systems will have larger bandwidths, which means another way to think about that is that faster systems will have faster, slowest poles. Now, that was a so mouthful, does, but I think I said it correctly. If, <laughs> if there's a frequency that you don't want in the system, does that mean you're gonna have to slow down the system in order to attenuate that? Hmm. Um, there's a frequency that you don't want. Like if it's a, if there's a lot of noise at uh, like a certain frequency and you don't want it, so you have to have something to filter it out. Then would that have to slow down the system by having a closer pole or a a, a closer um, frequency? 
frequency, quarter frequency? Yeah, so I think probably what you're getting at is we've been looking at pretty simple systems. Um, so if you wanted to have some kind of notch there and then carry on, uh, yeah, technically this would mean you'd need a lower bandwidth. This is kind of on the border between what I would call a low pass system and what I would call a notch filter. Um, so this would kind of lie on the cusp of where this definition of bandwidth does or does not make sense. Um, because if you make this notch nice and tight, then that actually plays into the spirit of, I don't have to care about these frequencies because the one frequency that I did care about, I've notched out. And so now all of a sudden I can operate up here. So I think the question is a good one, but I think it, it, it's pushing the boundaries of the realm in which this definition of bandwidth is applicable. Is that an acceptable okay. answer? Yeah. I think it's the best I can do. <laughs>